on behalf of the university, the School of Business and Hospitality Management, and the Department of Banking, Economics, and Finance, I would like to welcome you here this, here this evening for this presentation by Provider. I hope it's, it's an interesting one. Last week, we looked at Me too. Um, cyber technology and its impact on the economy. Happy to see this evening. We'll be looking at artificial intelligence and the structure of production. So this, this presentation, I think, would be just as interesting or more interesting than the presentations that were done last week. OK, with, uh, without further ado, I would just like to mention a few things. Um, please, if, if you're leaving or have to leave, I would like you to stay to the presentation. But it's just happened that you have to leave because of some emergency reasons. I would like you to do so quietly and, and pay attention and keep all electronics on silence so we can have um, the full um, attention of the presenter. Now I'd like to call Mr. Joseph Ford, a management student, to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, Mr. Joseph Ford. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Bailen, our very special, our very special guest from Sweden. Dr. Per L. Bailen grew up in eastern Sweden's beautiful archipelago, some 20 miles northeast of the capital of Stockholm. He is recently, he is currently enjoying his second professional career as a professor of entrepreneurship following previous experiences as systems developer, business consultant, elected politician, and entrepreneur. Bailen earned a bachelor's degree in business administration, majoring in corporate finance and accounting, and a master's degree in business informatics at the Yon Shopping International Business School in 1999. He then pursued a career in IT and business consultant in Stockholm. Perfectly timed with the bursting of the dot-com bubble, he worked primarily with web systems development and business process automation at Data Strategy, Moogle.com, and WOCHB. As a developer, he was certified as Microsoft Certified Professional four times and was in charge of internal competence development. During the end of his studies at Yon Shopping and the beginning of, beginning of his professional career in Stockholm, Bailen served as an elected member of the Municipal Council in his native Kuma, where he also served as a member of two municipal boards. He also held numerous positions with several political organizations until he turned his back on party politics in 2000. While pursuing his career, Bailen studied political science at Stockholm University and then moved to London in 2003 to earn a master's degree in political theory at Lund University. In 2004, he lived in the Republic of China and then continued his professional career as a business analyst at Guy Consul and then CIO at Nottingham ETT, both in Malmö, Sweden. In 2007, Bailen moved to the United States to pursue a doctorate in applied economics at the University of Missouri. Graduating in 2012, he spent the year 2012 to 2013 as an adjunct professor teaching entrepreneurship in the management department of Chulaski College of the Business at Mizu before moving to Waco, Texas for research professorship in the Department of Management and Entrepreneurship in the Han Kemer School of Business and the Bose Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise at Delhi University. Since 2015, he is assistant professor and holds the Rekas Johnson Professorship of Free Enterprise in the School of Entrepreneurship at Oklahoma State University. He currently lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma with his wife, Suzanne, and their plot hound, Georgia. With that, 
I ask, I ask that you give your full attention to Dr. Barlow and help me in welcoming him to the stage. Dr. Barlow. Thank you. Good work. Good work. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up um, and for staying in your chairs uh, until I'm done, I hope. Uh, thank you to the University of the Bahamas for inviting me and to the Nassau Institute as well. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about AI, artificial intelligence, and how that affects the market economy and how that's going to affect production as we see it in the future. Um, and basically what I'm going to tell you is what does your uh, futures look like in terms of your jobs and your careers? Is there going to be such a thing as a job or are we all screwed? That's a basic question, right, that I'm going to try to answer. And I'm going to do that from a sort of an economics point of view. So let's see if I can get this started here. There we go. So the outline for the talk is to first talk about what is economic growth and where does that come from? Uh, why do we have our standard of living the way it is today? And why is it different in different countries? Um, we're going to go into a little bit on, on what is capital for an economist. I mean, capital, usually when we think about it, is money. But to an economist, it's different. And what does that have to do with economic growth? What about innovation? What about entrepreneurship? We're going to talk about that a little bit as well. We're going to talk about productivity and wages, which, of course, then is going to tie into your job prospects after you graduate. Uh, and finally, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and robotics and automation and that whole thing that everybody's talking about. I'm not going to cover so much, is artificial intelligence going to kill us all? That's not my question. What I'm going to talk about is rather, what does it mean for the economy overall? Is this going to change everything? Is it going to be a completely new economy? Or can we use the tools that we already have, the theories we already have, to explain what is going on? So is it a major change, a completely new type of beast, or is it something that's just continuing uh, from before, maybe speeding up a little bit, but is it the same type of change as we've seen before? So that's the outline for my talk. So first then, where does prosperity come from? How is it created? Well, it really starts with the individual exchange, right? that I have something that you want, you have something that I want, and we don't really value those things the same. So we're both better off if we get together and we say, hey, I'll give you this which you really want if you give me that which you don't want as much, but I want more. Just like these gentlemen right here who are the pe people who uh, invented the market to begin with. Right? This is Grok and this is Grek. So, <laughs> That's a joke, obviously. It's okay to laugh. Okay, so there are really is a few basic core components to the market economy and how it works. And the basic exchange, the voluntary exchange, is really at the very core of how to understand the economy and how to understand your jobs in a, in a modern economy as well. So even though it might sound a little abstract, it's really not, because the whole economy can actually be explained just thinking about that one little unit, the exchange. Um, what we're talking about here is Grok and Grek just exchanging stuff because they, they are better off. And it is the case that whenever you enter a store and you buy something, isn't it true that you want that thing more than the money you give up to buy it? Of course it is, otherwise you wouldn't do it unless someone uh, threatened to hit you over the head or, or defrauded you or something like that. Isn't it also true at the same time that the store owner wants your money more than the good? It is, right? So it's really a Pareto improvement, as we would call it, that this is something where both parties are better off and no one is worse off. It's a win-win game. This is pretty amazing, isn't it? Of course, this also means that it has to be voluntary. If it's not voluntary, if you cheat, if you lie, if you defraud, if you say that this is a stick and I want that rock, let's trade, and it's not really a stick, it's something else, and it's something that you don't want, then I've defrauded you, then it's not actually voluntary. Right? So it, 
You need to be honest, you need to be true in order for this to happen. What this also means, of course, is that there is no such thing as indifference in a trade. Right? You might think of it that, yeah, this piece of gum, how much is a piece of gum? One cent, a dozen? Seven dozen? <laughs> 75 cents? Okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to buy gums. <laughs> okay, so 75 cents for a gum. That is the price that you pay for the gum, right? But it's not the case that you're indifferent whether you get 75 cents or a gum, unless you're in the store and you can buy whatever you like, right? Rather, you want to give up the 75 cents to get the gum, and the store owner wants to get the 75 cents for the gum. If you're indifferent, you're not going to do anything at all. You think, well, it doesn't matter to me. Why do anything at all? So the point here is that for any exchange like this, you are acting on the exchange. You are voluntarily trading because you are better off, and the other party is voluntarily exchanging with you because they are better off as well. Okay? Now, value is not something that we measure in dollars and cents, at least not when we study the economy. So value is really a matter of want satisfaction. So when you feel better off, that's not because you have more dollars. Well, it could be, I suppose. And it's not because you spent more dollars. It's a feeling, right? And you experience this feeling that you are in a better situation and you have sort of gotten rid of the pain or, or you feel like you're in a better situation for whatever reason. And this is what we do when we consume. And consume is not simply eating stuff, but anything that is consumption is really the creation of value for the simple reason that we find ourselves in a better uh, situation. That's how we define consumption as economists. So value is simply what we get out of consuming. And consuming could be such a thing as watching a movie, it could be as traveling somewhere, it could be eating something, it could be just exchanging, it could be anything that makes you feel a little better than, than you felt before. Um, but it needs to be, and remember this, value is directly experienced by whoever is consuming. Okay? So it's not about the, the number of, of zeros on the bills in your pocket. Those bills have only one purpose, and that is that you can go to the store and buy stuff that will make you feel better, that make you better off, whether that is a whole lot of sugar, or if it's a, a bowl of salad, or if it's a movie, or whatever it is. Okay? Production is what we call anything that facilitates consumption. Of course, we all know what production is. You produce goods, you produce services, that's what we do when we work. We produce something. Very often we produce something. We have no clue how anybody can feel better off consuming whatever you're producing. But hey, they're paying you for it, so what the heck, right? Well, we produce all these goods and services for the single purpose of helping someone consume. So the reason something is valued is because they are directly experiencing a satisfaction from it. And we try to produce stuff overall in the economy so that people can get this sense of satisfaction. So all we try to do with production is really to make sure that people, the people we're aiming for, to sell to, that they get the satisfaction. And we do this by increasing the scope and the frequency and the intensity of the satisfaction that they feel from it. Right? And remember, if they believe that they will be better off from whatever it is you're producing, they will probably exchange with you, unless you set the price way too high. Okay, so production, of course, then is core to understanding the economy. If that is how we facilitate people's consumption, which is how they become better off, which is basically how we produce a, an ability for people to have value in their lives, well, then we need to explain what production is. And just to show you that this is something that we've known for a very long time and it still applies, we're going to go back to this old dude right here, Adam Smith, the so-called father of economics. And he wrote a book in 1776. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody here was born back then, but maybe someone. 
called the wealth of nations, right? Where he was trying to explain where does this wealth of nations come from. And wealth, of course, has something to do with value, right? So, obviously, he had something to say about production. Because that is what facilitates consumption, which is the experience of value. Now, he talked about the division of labor, which is really specializing that instead of doing everything for ourselves, maybe if I do a little bit and you do the next part and you do that third bit, then we can be a little more effective and produce a little more, <coughs> right? And just like in this cartoon right here, which is sort of a little joke on this, right? That, oh, back in my day, we, we did everything. Now, now everybody has to be a damn specialist, right? Now every, people are either hunters or gatherers, not hunter-gatherers. Well, the whole economy is sort of progressing in, in that direction. Adam Smith identified that there are three main reasons why uh, the division of labor makes you more productive in production. Why is there more outcome when we divide labor? Well, he said there's an increase in dexterity. Whoops, that's what I was not supposed to do. Uh, there's an increase in dexterity. So basically, you learn on the job. You get better and better and more skilled at whatever it is you're doing. <coughs> you're saving time because if you have to produce something and, and do all these different tasks, switching between them means that you're losing a lot of time. Many of you are probably, I'm guessing, uh, switching between tasks in the classroom. So you're probably listening to the professor while you're also checking Facebook or Snapchat, right? And you think that maybe you're doing both at the same time. Well, that's not actually how the mind works. You're doing one thing and then you're switching to the next. And every time you lose a little bit of time and a little bit of, of attention. So you're actually losing a whole lot. So maybe instead you should only focus on Facebook. Uh, sorry, the professor. <laughs> OK. And he also saw that, well, if this is the case that everybody does just a part of the production, then it's so much easier for them to find new ways of doing things that are a little more effective. Right? So people, workmen themselves, will find that there are tools. Maybe I can change the tool a little bit, and, and that will make me more effective. Maybe I can produce a whole lot more. You know, I don't have to work as hard, or I don't have to work as long hours, or something like that. Right? We're all lazy. True? Yeah, of course. And that's a great thing. That's a human virtue. Right? Because because we're lazy, we're trying to figure out how to escape work. And that's a good thing if we're escaping work by becoming better at working. Right? If we work smarter, not just putting it in someone else's lap. Okay? So those three are the benefits that he identified already in the 1770s. And is it true that you make this makes you a whole lot more productive? Well, he had the example of a pin factory uh, back in England in the 17-something, before 1776, where he talked about how they had all these different tasks that you needed to carry out in order to produce the pins. And instead of having each person in their own corner doing all of those tasks, producing one pin and then producing the next one, if they specialized in doing different tasks, they would be, do a whole lot more. So this is his famous pin factory example. And you go, okay, well, yeah, maybe you're a little more effective. Maybe you don't lose as much time, but does it have all that much of a difference? Uh, yeah, it does. This is from his book. And what it says is basically that the bolded uh, words here, that he divide, in the pin factory, you divide the production into a number of tasks. And it says that, Ten persons doing different things and basically handing off the half-finished goods to each other, right? instead of doing all the tasks themselves, they could make something like 48,000 pins in a day, or 4,800 pins per person. Well, look at here. If they had all wrought separately and independently, if they had worked alone on producing the pins, then they would have produced not 20 each, some not even one. While the difference between one or 20 
say, let's say, let's be generous. Let's say they did produce 20. The difference between the 20 and the 4,800, that's a big difference in just focusing and specializing. The division of labor in just freaking pin factory, come on. Right, back then, without any, any specialized tools, without any robots or anything like that, still simply focusing and specializing meant that you went from 20 to 4,800 pins a person. That's a lot of productivity right there, right? Okay, so next dude, David Ricardo. When, when Smith was talking about the pin factory, basically what he did was, in his example anyway, drag in people at random from the street and say, here you go, you're in a pin factory, do your thing, right? So you might not be in the right place, you might be better at doing that thing over there, but now you're here. Right? So of course, of course you're going to learn fast, like he talked about. Of course you're going to save time because you're focusing on this thing. And, but David Ricardo talked about that there's a comparative advantage. We're not identical. Right? We're all a little better and a little worse on different things. Right? So maybe you can put the right man in the right place instead of just placing them in the production process at random. So that's the comparative advantage, right? It's not about you being absolutely better in terms of the number of goods you produce, but if, you're, if there are two of you and I'm better than you at everything, but you are relatively speaking better at this other thing, it's better for both of us if I focus on what I'm best at, you focus on what you're relatively speaking best at, and then we trade. Because that means we produce more together and thereby satisfy more wants for both of us than uh, if we would just do everything ourselves. Right? So combine the division of labor with putting people in the right place and playing off of people's strengths. Well, then you should get a whole lot more than the 4,800 pins instead of the 20. So maybe now you're at, well, who knows? 7,000 instead of 20, that's a whole lot of pins. I'm not sure who's going to buy those pins, but it's a cool example. Okay, so the third dude is Joseph Schumpeter, and now we're in the 20th century. He talked about creative destruction, or innovation, really. Right? How by innovating something new, you destroy the old. It does not mean, like the, the scary guy on the first slide, it does not mean that you shoot people. It does not mean that you blow up a factory or something like that. What it means is think, simply think the iPhone and the flip phone. How many of you have flip phones? <laughs> George. <laughs> okay, how many of you have smartphones? Hey, look at that. Well, it's not because someone was standing with a hammer destroying each flip phone. Make sure that everybody had to buy smartphones, except for George. That's not what happened, right? What happened was that by creating the first iPhone, Steve Jobs and Apple pr proved to people that there is a better way of doing things. Whoa, look at that, everybody said. That's like really cool. I want one of, that in, one of those instead of the flip phone. So they would instead choose to buy the, uh, the smartphone. Well, that meant that there is no market anymore, except for George for flip phones. So in a sense, you destroy that market, that type of production, because production moves over to producing smartphones instead. So an, an innovation is uh, creatively destructive because it provides you a whole lot more value. You want the new thing a whole lot more, right? And because you want that new thing a whole lot more, you're no longer going to demand that other thing, the, the old thing. Right? So when the new Pixel 3 enters, uh, the market is released. Nobody wants the Pixel 2 anymore, assuming anybody wants the Pixel 3. I don't know. OK. So what he talked about was really new combinations of resources. And of course, we can think of in, in any type of manufacturing and production, you're combining resources in a new way. So the, you have different components in the flip phone and in the smartphone, but they're all sort of plastic and, and, uh, and the processing units and all this stuff, right? So you produce different, different combinations of all those resources. And you need to figure out 
how to do that in the best way possible. How can you create value in the best way possible for consumers? Because that's where value is, right? In consumption. Okay, so he said that, well, there are different ways you can do this. If you innovate, you can do that by producing completely new goods, which is the iPhone, right? When everybody had a flip phone, the iPhone was a new good. You can create new methods of production, so you can innovate a new type of, of procedure, maybe, or machine, or whatever. And you can find new markets, or you can bring a product to a new market, which creates value in this, in this new market. You can find a new source of supply, which of course changes everything. If we would find, strike gold right here, that would change everything for all of us, I think. Right? Or you can just organize differently. So you can have a business that you use people in a different way. Maybe you have sort of a networking organization instead of a fixed hierarchy. Maybe you get rid of the bureaucracy and instead have some bidding mechanism in, in, the, in the business, or maybe you have a really scary dude who is a manager so no one dares shirk at work. Whatever it is, some kind of innovation uh, within the organization. Okay, so think of those three dudes and they're pretty simple ideas. Add them together, we're gonna have a, a lot of pins, but we're gonna have that in any industry and in any type of production. Right? Okay, so we get to capital, which I mentioned in the beginning. The capital for it, the when we study the economy and economics, is not simply money, right? It, those are the means of production. So those are all the tools we use. Those are all the factories that we use. Those are all the robots. Uh, all of those things, right? They have only one purpose. All of these things. There's only one thing that they do. They mean, they mean that we can get more output per labor unit, per labor hour. So think about it this way. We're to dig a hole. Okay, so we can either dig with our hands. It would take a whole lot of time. It would probably hurt us a bit too. Or we can use a shovel. That would probably be faster, right? That would probably be a little bit more comfortable. Or we could use a bulldozer. Well, the shovel is capital. The bulldozer is just more advanced capital. But what they do is mean that we don't have to use as much labor anymore. Right? Digging that hole with only our bare hands, it's going to take a whole lot of manpower. Either I do it alone, which I'm a professor, so I'm going to use students to do it instead, of course. <laughs> but either I do it alone, or I, a lot of people are going to do it for me it's still going to take a very long time. With shovels, I'm going to be able to cut that time quite a bit, but not completely, right? But with a bulldozer, I can probably do it in a day. So the, how advanced capital is is really important because, hey, that means that instead of all of our, us digging that, that uh, pit, we can do other things, right? We can all get our own pits. All, we all get our own all, own uh, holes in the ground, okay? But what that means is that capital in itself has value simply because it contributes to ultimate consumption, right? So what, you invest in capital and you produce, you use capital in the production process so that uh, you, you don't have to use as much labor anymore because labor is the most scarce resource we have and we'll get back to that. And that means we can get a whole lot of output. Why do we want output? Well, for consumption. That's what we started out by saying, right? That if we produce something that people really want and that makes people better off, then that is value for them. And they're willing to give up something for us in return, usually money. Because with money, we can buy something that we want to consume, right? Makes complete sense, right? Good. Okay, so here's an example of using cap, uh, capital, a different, a differently advanced capital, right? Uh, that, okay, so both are mines, but basically digging the, the hole in the ground, right? Uh, here, they're working, there are plenty of people working here. They do have capital, don't they? They have hacks and shovels and I don't know what else. And then, hmm? And carts even, yeah, they're pretty advanced. 
And up here, that's also a mine, but different, right? Not only is she looking a whole lot happier than these guys are, but she can be a whole lot more productive using that big ass machine. <laughs> she can dig a really hole, big hole in the ground really fast in just a few hours, whereas these guys, they have to labor forever to just make a little dent in the mountains. All right, so see the difference with capital? Having a lot of capital like this means that the, your job is going to be, her job is probably safer and more comfortable than their job. Right? And she's a whole lot more productive as well, which means that she can make a, a better uh, wage as well. She can earn more money because she's so, so much more productive. So much more output is being created by this person and the people producing the machine than by these people. This is, this is so inefficient. Okay, so what is production like now in the, in the economy that we're all part of? Well, we have specialization under the division of labor, and it's very intensive, it's very advanced. So people have these really strange jobs in companies where they sit in a cubicle and they do something and they have no clue why, simply because they're focused on that and they're being really, really productive in doing that, which contributes to the whole company's production. Right? And this can be a part of a really, really long and advanced supply chain as well, meaning that this person contributes an essential part to whatever consumption happens at the very end, but there might not be an obvious relationship between them. We also have comparative advantage, because we get to choose what we work with. We don't get to choose to get a salary for doing nothing, but we do get to choose our careers. And many of us choose something that we're either good at or that we like doing. And when that is the case, of course, then we're going to be a whole lot more productive than whoever is working over there with something they really, really, really hate. You're not going to do a whole lot of work. And since you have all these different jobs and you have different tracks at, the, at a university, you can study different things and become expert in different things. We can really play the comparative advantage. Of course, how many of you think that we have innovations? Duh. Plenty of them, right? Especially in high tech. We have so many innovations that we have new gadgets all the time. So we have plenty of that too. And our accumulated productive capital, we have a lot too. In this room, we have a lot, right? So we have the projector, we have the chairs, we have all of this stuff. It's all capital. And we're using it, in this case, to listen to me, but we're using it in sort of a productive manner, right? These resources could be used in a different way too, but we've, someone has decided that this is a productive use for these resources, okay? Now, all of this takes place, all of this has happened in the economy without someone saying that, oh, you go there, you go there, you learn this, uh, you take this hammer. No one really plans this. Right? Instead, it's an order. Production happens, but businesses, they compete with each other. They're part of supply chains. They might change from one market to the next. It looks sort of chaotic, right? And it's growing constantly. The economy is getting better and better and better and creating more and more value. There's basically more stuff to consume, more entertainment for us, more of everything. So our lives get better as a result of that. But how does it happen? Well, the core to understanding this is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is the driving force that sort of allocates resources to where they think that they will produce more value. You can't know this beforehand. You have to imagine that, oh, maybe Steve Jobs thought, hmm, you know, back in those days when everybody had a flip phones, the flip phone was supposed to be as small as possible. Every year the flip phone was smaller and smaller and smaller, and the smaller it was, the fancier it was. I had one of those really great ones with like a one inch color screen. Pretty cool, right? You could place awesome phone calls on it. You can even text, but you couldn't do a whole lot more. 
And then Steve Jobs was like, well, you know, I think people actually would enjoy a big-ass phone in their pockets instead. A really huge one where you can sort of surf the internet sometimes. And as was the case for iPhone 1, you can also almost place a phone call on it. Because it really sucked placing phone calls on the first iPhone. Well, you have to imagine that. You can't know this in advance. You have to produce it and then see if people actually want it and show people why this might be good for them in their lives. OK? And one example of this is what Henry Ford never said, but it's very often attributed to him, that had I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Well, he was going to provide them with cars because cars are a whole lot better, and he realized or imagined that people would be better off with cars than with faster horses. And don't ask me how to produce a faster horse. I have no idea. But that's what people would have wanted if he had asked them. That's what he never said. OK? Now, this might sound like, well, with all this creative destruction and everything, where is this heading? Does this mean that there is no use for us as people, that we're not going to find any jobs and all this stuff? Well, think of agriculture. So this is the curve of the fraction of people employed in agriculture over time. And it's fallen from 43.5% or so to 20, I can't even read this, 25%. This is between nine, 1991 and 2015 in the world population. Do you think we have a whole lot of farmers everywhere looking for work? No, we don't. They have some other job. This is just 25 years. Whereas in many of, of the developed countries, almost 100% of everybody was working in agriculture, toiling the fields with these not very advanced tools. And now, in the US, 2% of the population work on farms. But we have a whole lot more food, and you can tell when you see Americans that there's a lot of food around. Right? And people make a whole lot more money, too, and people get other jobs than in agriculture. They get jobs that they probably like more, where they're more productive and so forth. So development doesn't have to spell disaster. Rather, we see that when people go to jobs where they're more productive, with more capital, they always get higher salaries. So the more capital there is to replace people, the higher salaries they get, simply because for each labor hour invested, you get a whole lot of more output. And that's sort of a universal truth. And there are plenty of data to, to show this. The problem here, of course, is that if you try to force it, if you say that, well, let's make sure that everybody gets a million dollars an hour. Because then we don't, wouldn't have poverty anymore. Well, not a whole lot of people are worth a million dollars when they produce. So they will, they will not get a job. Pretty much everybody will not get a job. Right? But it could be the case in, in the near future that everybody gets a million dollars for a, an hour of work. If we're productive enough, if we create enough value, we could get a million dollars back for one hour, simply because we have the tools necessary, we have the capital, the advanced capital necessary. <coughs> but it has to be a process where we increase productivity first so that we can get that higher payment. We can't increase the payment first and then hope that we get more productive. They have to go together. Okay. Okay, so nice story, but what about AI? What about the scary guy on the first slide? Are they going to kill us or not? Or are they going to kill our jobs? Which is probably the, the, the major question, right? Well, some people seem to think that this is a huge problem, right? So you have three famous guys, Stephen Hawking, um, you have Elon Musk, Musk and you have Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, they all seem to think that this is a huge problem, that AI is going to completely change everything, and it's going to really 
pull the rug from under our feet, and then we're going to have mass unemployment, and everything is going down the tubes, pretty much. But of course, we can't really stop it. So what do we do? Well, look at Steve Wozniak's uh, quote, for instance, here. If we build these devices, and someone is going to build them no matter what, and so we can't really avoid it, uh, and they take care of everything for us, oh, the horror, they will be better at us than us at doing everything, basically. Well, sooner or, sooner or later, they're going to get rid of us because we are not as productive as they are. Well, it seems reasonable, right? Well, not so fast. I, I don't think that is a, a very smart way of thinking about it. Rather, I, th I think what they're doing is pointing out a problem that doesn't necessarily exist at all. I mean, in a sense, they're high-tech gurus, gurus who are also Luddites, which seems a little odd, but I think in a sense they are, just like these guys here protesting the guy who invented the wheel. Like, we don't want no wheel. We're, we're well off already. We're, we don't have to go faster, that sort of thing, right? They're sort of protesting against this new technology, just in the same sense as these guys were protesting, if anybody was protesting the wheel, right? Because economically speaking, this is a different story. I think Elon Musk usually talks about if we have war machines and they're programmed to kill people, they will kill people. That seems to follow. But economically speaking, what if we use advanced technology and machines to replace people in factories and, and to make production more effective and more efficient so we can increase output? Is that a problem? Well, not really, because AI is really just productive capital. Just like the bulldozer or the, uh, the shovel or whatever, it improves the productivity of labor. That's never been a problem so far. What that means is that we can work much shorter hours and make a whole lot more money doing it so we can satisfy our own wants much better way working a whole lot less. That's basically what it means, right? And as capital, it will also relieve people from dangerous work, uh, from boring work, from repetitive tasks, all of these things. It can help us refine production processes. If, if it's really artificial intelligence and if it's sort of smart, it can find different ways of doing things. Right? So you can install it in a factory and maybe the AI says, oh, let's move this machine a little bit that way and let's, let's do this process in a different manner. And then we can increase output a little more. We can reduce waste in, in the factory, which means we get more output from the same facility. Right? We, we don't have to use as much labor anymore. That's also the same thing as any other type of capital. The thing here is that will, it, will AI replace us completely? No, because of this thing called entrepreneurship. Because an artificial intelligence cannot do entrepreneurship. And why is that? Because entrepreneurship is about imagining how to satisfy people's wants. Right? The whole economy, all of production, everything, is directed towards providing value for people. Production facilitates consumption. Well, an artificial intelligence can do something completely different because it, it believes that is a good thing for itself. That has really no uh, relevance for us as people. The economy is about value for people. And think about it, would an AI have invented the iPhone? Thinking that, ooh, all I know about how people are and what people do in their lives, I can imagine that they would really want this thing right here in this manner, and it would work this way, and it should have a graphical user interface like this. No, a human being can figure that out. Right? A human being can understand other human beings. An artificial intelligence, that's a robot. They can help us uh, do tasks, can help us produce things, can probably help us refine production processes, but it can't help us imagine new ways uh, or new goods, new ways of creating value for consumers, helping people establish other behaviors that are more valuable to them, which is what we're talking about in, in an economy. That is value. So 
And what is an artificial intelligence that we use in a factory that doesn't create value? It's a waste. It's really, 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 really efficient at producing something that no one at all wants. What is that about? Right? An artificial intelligence can probably say, oh, well, you know, probabilities left and right, and, and maybe I can produce something that is a, a little shinier than that other object and so forth. Well, it could be the case that everybody's behavior has changed when you finally have this good available. And entrepreneurs see this all the time. They try all these things, right? All of them try a whole lot of things, and most of them fail, even though they are also people. So how the heck would an artificial intelligence understand people better than people? It won't. It can't unless it is a complete clone of us. And then we might not talk about artificial intelligence anymore. Then it's basically us, right? So since value is in the eyes of consumers and value is in consumption, AI is no threat. AI is just like any other productive capital. It will simply make us more productive, make us uh, increase our ability to satisfy people's wants, right? So in, in a sense, AI can use us to produce really, really fast horses, to use the words that Henry Ford never used. But they can't invent new cars because they don't understand people well enough, right? And especially not now. I mean, how many of you are using Skype now and then? Or at least know what it is? You know what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Whew. <laughs> okay, so in Skype there is an artificial intelligence, they call it, which simply blurs the background. So you can, you can toggle it and turn it on and off. What it does is simply try to figure out, okay, what is the person and what is not the person? And then it blurs whatever is not you. That is what we call artificial intelligence today. That doesn't seem like a huge threat to our jobs in our future, right? So we're definitely not there yet where artificial intelligence is intelligent. But even when it is, it can't understand what it is to be a human being, what it is to be a person. Okay, so what can we expect from artificial intelligence when we finally get there? Well, since it's productive capital, we should definitely expect to work less and earn more money. If you think that's a problem, then, then you're weird. <laughs> it also means that we're going to have lower prices because we're going to be so much more effective and so much more productive. So we're going to have lower prices and we're probably going to have more goods. We're going to be better at using the natural resources available. We're going to produce probably a more differentiated goods, different kinds of goods for different people because entrepreneurs figure out how to do that, and with lower cost of production, you can produce for smaller markets. We're going to have new types of jobs, so we're going to have less of manual work, we're going to have less of dangerous work, less of hard work, and less of body work. We're going to have a whole lot more of using this resource up here. It's going to be focused on being an entrepreneur, on being creative, it's going to be focused on creating more value for people. So in a sense, it's about figuring out new types of goods. But it also, it's also about understanding what people are like and feeling with them and figuring out, well, how can I help people in their everyday lives, if their lives are something like this that I understand? How can I make that better for them? Well, that's true value, and people will be willing to pay for it, especially when we start making more money. There will, of course, be transition pains, as economists call it, because you can't take someone who is currently working with a shovel in, in, a, in a mine and just put him somewhere and say, hey, be an entrepreneur. So there's going to be some unemployment for some people at, during this transition. Hey, AI is not here. Like what we call AI today is nowhere near intelligent, just like the Skype example. So, the whole economy will be sort of restructured. It will be more automated. 
production processes will run themselves. We'll need a little maintenance here and there. Someone will sti still need to figure out what the freaking production process should do and whether that is actually valuable to people. Someone will need to figure that out. And intelligence, artificial intelligence can't do that. A human intelligence certainly can. Okay? And it will require some re-education, very likely, especially if this happens uh, fast. Okay, so what about unemployment with all this? Well, in a sense, AI is just like a tractor. Right? So just like we don't have millions or even billions of unemployed farmers running around in the streets today demanding jobs, we're not going to have millions and billions of people running around saying that we, they demand manual labor work. Because this is a process that unfolds over time. So we're going to look back and say, whew, I'm so glad I was not born decades earlier so that I had, would have to have those really crappy jobs that people had back then. Now I wake up, I turn on my hologram or whatever it is, and then I just talk to the hologram a little bit and invent new things that people can do and new value for people. And then I'm done, done with work for the week or the month. So is this a completely new economy then with AI and artificial intelligence as some people claim? Well, no, it's not really. It's, it's the next generation of production. It's a new way of producing things, just like the tractor was new to agriculture. Um, just like any innovation is new to any production process, any new type of good is a, a novelty in the market. Well, AI is a novelty too, but it's not going to change how the economy works. The economy is going to work exactly the same way, because the economy has one purpose, providing people with value. And that is on their terms, so you have to understand them, and you have to give them whatever facilitates their value creation and consumption. So we're going to get more automation out of AI, because AI could probably s help us solve a whole lot of problems in production. It's going to increase our capacity in production. It's going to increase our output. So we're going to produce a whole lot of more stuff and services and entertainment and what else have you. It's going to create a, diff a new type of job market in the sense that we're going to work a whole lot shorter hours. It's not probably not going to happen when you graduate, but in a couple of decades, expect jobs to not be 40-hour work weeks unless you prefer to have them that, like that. Okay, So sh shorter work weeks, some might not even have work weeks, simply because you might work a few years when you're young, and then that's it. Maybe you have a return on that investment forever. You're gonna make, because you're going to make a whole lot more money. And at the same time, because productivity is increasing, goods are going to uh, cost a whole lot less. So what does that spell for most people? Higher salaries, lower prices. Hey, I'm rich, man. That's what it means. Right? So the ultimate human resource, ingenuity, our minds, that's not something that you can replace. You can replace it for sort of very simple tasks where we probably shouldn't use people anyway. There we can use a machine instead. Just like the, the, sh the bulldozer got rid of people with shovels, those people can now do something that is really meaningful to them and to consumers. So what I think will happen, I mean, the, there might be some bumps on the road, of course, but it, we should be optimistic because economically speaking, this is definitely not a threat. This is an opportunity. And it's an opportunity that's going to happen no matter what, which is pretty awesome. So the dude is saying, we're going to be a whole lot richer no matter what. Oh, no. Hate on him. It's a Jetson's life, if you know that, that cartoon, is pretty awesome. You don't have to work a whole lot, and you make a whole lot of more money. You have a fantastic life. You can get all the health care you want and whatever else. And flying cars, you can have that too. This year would be awesome. <laughs> right, so you can fly to Florida for grocery shopping with your car. 
That would be pretty cool. Okay? And the prices are much lower, and you don't even need gas. So that's, I think, is what I, what, I, what I think we should expect from AI. If I knew when it would happen, I would probably bet money on it, but I have no clue. But it will happen, and it's just the next stage in our economies as they develop. We will become a whole lot richer if we can just stay alive. So that's my advice to you guys. Get a finish, stay alive is number one. <laughs> number two, is finish your degrees and find, find a way to produce actual value for other people. Because that's how you will find a place in the economy and you will get paid for it. That's what you need to do. And if you always think about how can I produce the most, most treasured or the most valuable thing for other people on their terms, you're always in a good situation. You're always in a good spot. Because then uh, someone will always be willing to pay you for it, probably more than you value the thing. OK, so I'll stop there, and we'll open up for questions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I think that's true because I think like when wages increase, they may increase the prices of the food. Uh, true, but remember why the wages go up? It's because productivity goes up even more. Okay, so per unit produced, the cost of that person uh, working is going to be a whole lot lower. So the whole, whole point of capital is to make us more productive. So we're going to be able to produce a ton of pins every hour we work because we have all these tools and AI and everything to help us. So for each pin that we produce, the cost of labor is going to be so much lower. So we, we have seen this so far that in most ad advanced economies, wages go up and prices still fall, or they are the same, but it still doesn't matter because wages go up. Okay, so that's what theory, economic theory would tell us. That's also what, we, what we've seen historically. Yes, sir. All right, I have two questions. Um, the first one, so as it relates to job loss, right? Yes. In less developed countries where the population is as technology savvy, in that instance, what do you think would be the effect? So, for instance, in the U.S., well, I don't know, say in the next 10 years, they use 2 million jobs from automation. Whereas compared to here where everyone has you know, technology savvy, where, where you can take those workers and send them elsewhere and maybe they'll adjust and not be the same here. So what would you think be like the after effects of a situation like that? Well, it depends on when you mean. Because uh, immediately when someone automates a factory, the factory workers will be unemployed. So I mean, there's a transition phase before they find other jobs and before they're retrained and so forth. But if you think about this historically, everybody was in agriculture before. Everybody, because that's how you survived, and most, many people starved anyway. But today, almost no one, comparatively speaking, is in agriculture. The population in the world is a whole lot bigger, and still we have too much food, right? And it's not the case that 98% of people in the U.S. are unemployed because no one is working on farms anymore. Because instead, we're making up these other, other jobs where we can produce value for people. Entrepreneurial jobs, innovation, technology, all of these things. I can't tell you where those jobs will be. And I can tell you that you don't have to be technologically savvy uh, in order to get all those jobs. Right? Hmm? Well, you, right, you will be taught probably on the job. I mean, that's, that's probably the best training. The second question, so with AI and automation um, and a lot of jobs being, well, the robots taking over a lot of jobs, neighbors are very, that's usually the most expensive as it comes to business. Yeah. So do you think that there'd be like a universal income being implemented? Because well. Because you've got the robots, so the companies making 
and maybe 50% of their expenses going right away, so they have high profit margins. Yes, if there's no competition, right? So, could, could you restate that question again? So the I'm saying universal basic universal income. Universal basic income, right. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's a political question. Uh, Maybe. Uh, it will probably be tried. Right. That the immediate unemployment may generate the demand for the universal basic income. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not going to happen in all sec sectors at once, right? So I I don't think we're going to see mass unemployment unless there is like a, a depression or something like that. But that's not because of AI. So we're not going to see a whole lot of more unemployment overall because of this development. So that's not going to be a driving force towards universal basic income. So it, I think it is completely a political issue, whether, whether politicians want to basically give people a free handout or a free minimum level, that sort of thing. But overall, I think that would be a disaster for the simple reason that if you already have an income, you might not seek out where you produce value anymore. Right? So, but that also depends on the level of the universal basic income. I mean, they, I know they tried this in Finland. Uh, and they tried to, they had like a sample of people where they gave them universal basic income. And they stopped the experiment because it didn't work out at all. So uh, they, they didn't get much out of it and people stopped trying to get jobs and so forth. Uh, so that was a failure. Could you try a different type of universal basic income, a different structured system, maybe? I'm sure. Politicians make up a whole lot of the different things that they try all the time. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure someone is going to try it somewhere. I don't think it's going to work out. And very often the argument for universal basic income is to replace all the programs that we have today with a universal basic income because that would be cheaper. I don't think politicians will be able to cut those programs. So I think the universal basic income would be in addition to the programs, so which, which just means that it's not going to be cheaper. And it's going to be, it's going to create perverse incentives too. Right, because you get paid whether or not you do work. So. Even if you would want more payment, it means that you will think about how to produce value in the economy much later. Which is a problem for any country that uh, enforces this type of policy. Because the population would be less inclined to work towards value. So it, there, there's a big danger in that. But will it happen? No idea. Yes, ma'am. To replace the professors, you mean? <laughs> uh, I don't think AI is so advanced yet that you can use it to a whole lot of things. Um, what you can do is to help, I mean, you have search algorithms in the, the library and so forth. Uh, maybe tracking students' progress toward a degree and a warning system that is automated, things like that. But right now, it's not, it's not very advanced. Several, right. several publishing firms are working towards this. Um, McGraw-Hill, Pearson, Sage, uh, Wiley, Norton. And what they're trying to do, and because I did consulting work with this, what they're trying to do is help students um, increase their GPAs, their grades and classes in general, by developing essentially predictive uh, programs to aid in particular individuals' learning styles. So they're trying to more target individual student styles. Mm -hmm. um, but one of, one of the things that I talked about in my class this morning that you brought up is that it's not that smart yet, right? Mm -hmm. it's not, it, you're, you still need professors to kind of guide the readings and to direct attention towards certain things. But it's a great promise. Right? When it finally gets more advanced, then you can get a tailored education for each student. I mean, David Ricardo again, right? What are you good at? What, are, what is your passion? 
how can you really capitalize on what you find really interesting? And what can you become really good at doing? Well, an AI can figure that out. Maybe if you have a bunch of professors, they could eventually figure that out. But maybe that AI can analyze you and ask some questions and figure that out much faster and tell you that, you know, right now you should probably focus more on this class because you're, la you're lacking some skills here and you're falling behind. So you should definitely invest more hours here. So, I mean, it could be your personal assistant through college. I see that happening, but probably not in a while, unfortunately. Yes? It would make it a better economy? Well, I mean, it depends on how you implement it, of course. But what it would do is make the economy more productive. And an economy that is more productive would create more value, which would make you a whole <coughs> lot richer. I think if you, I don't think this is possible, but if you would implement AI everywhere, like really smart sort of future stuff, sci-fi AI, everywhere in the economy right now, you would probably see some inequality as a result because some people would, would get rich faster than others. Uh, but I, I think that would even out in time because goods, the price of goods would fall uh, really fast and there would be more jobs available as well. Related question. Yes. Is an AI uh, like uh, the culmination of a longer process of capital accumulation? Yes, yes it is. Therefore, so, for countries that haven't gone through the late stages of that process of accumulation, AI is farther away. It is, but it's not going to take as long as it did for the developed countries. Of course, because you, can, you can catch up. The of the right, right. Model. You avoid the mistakes that the developing world made. You still need a lot of capital. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, you can't... If you don't have any automated trains, you can't just install a software in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an engine car. That, that, does, that doesn't work. You, you need everything around it as well to run the engine car and figure everything out. And you probably need new signaling system along the railroad and things like that. So yeah, you need to, you need to make sure that everything is on par with what you're implementing. You can't go too far ahead. There, there is another thing. Bahamas is basically a services. Therefore, uh, the displacement can only be in those repetitive tasks that uh, are not essential part of the service. Yeah. The service, service will continue. One service that you might think about, and now I don't know if it's going too far, but imagine if jitney drivers had AI-assisted GPS to more efficiently run routes, right, where the consumer could uh, expect a certain jitney on at a certain schedule, right? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going too far with this. At, at a schedule. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, that would be a good one. what George mentioned here, that the Bahamas is a service-oriented economy, that's awesome. Because what that means is that you already have places for people and face-to-face -face interaction, right? Remember what I put on the previous slides over here? I mean. AI will take over physical production of goods first. Because those are the jobs where human ingenuity is not all that needed. In service jobs, in entrepreneurship, in innovation, that's where we need people. So in a sense, I mean, it's a whole lot easier for a service-based economy to adopt the new technology and really leapfrog uh, the developed economies simply because you don't have all this crap, basically, all these factories and all this infrastructure that is old and need maintenance, repair, and all this stuff, that's really, really, really costly. And since you don't have that, and instead you're basically already in the next economy, it's a whole lot easier to just embrace it and grow from it. I mean, that's a, that's a huge opportunity. Any other questions? I have one. Uh, so, in, uh, in, the, in the failed, like, communist societies that try to implement five-year plans, that try to predict uh, production and, and then head mm -hmm. out to the quotas, that kind of stuff. Currently, there's, there's a popular uh, sort of 
subculture on the internet that believes that AI would be able to take over the failures of the, of the lack of a pricing mechanism. Um, and there is such a thing as, as predictive advertising. And so, you know, big, big tech, Amazon, Google, Facebook, collects our personalized data to the extent where they can basically advertise to us what we're gonna want tomorrow. Um, so, you know, in, in 10, 20 years, uh, you know, is AI gonna be able to provide a five-year plan? Well, it can provide a plan for sure. Uh, I mean, is it a good plan? I think AI might be able to do a better job than people in planning a society like that for the simple reason that it can process a whole lot more information. So if the information is there, but you still don't go get around the entrepreneurship problem, right? For the economy to produce value for people, you need entrepreneurship. You need to imagine what people will want and satisfy their wants. The problem with the socialist economies is that the first thing they do is say, screw people, right? What people want, uh, they should want this stuff, and we can plan for that. They well, slower horses. They get, well, that's what they get after a while, right? They get the slower horses. But you have the planners say, rather than the entrepreneurs saying that you should, we should, we should focus on this instead of that. Well, from the top down. That's not entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is about everybody trying, all of these entrepreneurs putting their own money into this, having real skin in the game, and really believing in their ideas, and still most fail. Well, if you have one decision point, that can only fail. I mean, there's almost, the pro probability for it to succeed is almost zero. So it, I think it can aid decision makers, for sure. I mean, look at where that is at right now. Uh, the search engine Bing has an AI-like system using big data, trying to figure out which team is going to win the next uh, football game, running all the stats available, everything they can think of, weather and all this stuff. It's right about two-thirds of the time, which is better than a coin toss, but it's nowhere near 100%. But bookies, they beat big data. They're so much better at putting odds at those teams playing than the AI is using all this data. Why? Because they, they look at the players, they understand the game, they understand people, they understand the pressure they're under in this particular game and all this stuff that you can't actually measure. So, I mean, go to the bookies. They would probably be better at running the country too than, than AI. being depressed because AI is now seen as an alternative to labor. So what you're going to have happening is that firms are now going to substitute physical human labor for capital. And as a result of that, wages is going to go down. And my conclusion from listening to you, are you suggesting that entrepreneurship would be the only alternative for those people who are left out? Or not left out, but those people who, are, who, who, who want to become more creative and be a part of the growing economy? Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by entrepreneurship. But I think, I think you're right that wages for those exact things that are automated would go down. But that doesn't mean the wages overall will go down. Right? So, and what I meant by entrepreneurship is not simply everybody needs to start their own business or everybody needs to become Steve Jobs. Uh, what, what I meant was that we need to think about this and think with this, that our main resource is the ingenuity that we have, our imagination. And I think in the future, a whole lot of people will find uh, a source of income in their hobbies because they entertain people or because they paint uh, images in a certain way that some people like and all this stuff. And we see this in all economies where everything gets sort of... Uh, mass-produced, that suddenly there's a huge value in having something that is uglier, I mean, to tell the truth, but that is made by a real person. So you get these sort of niche markets 
where man-made stuff, like homemade meal, people pay more for something that is a homemade meal than if you go to a restaurant or buy these frozen dinners and stuff like that. So there's, there are a whole lot of these niche economies that are going to uh, emerge from basically nowhere because people are suddenly willing to pay for a specific service or something that is made by a human or, or whatever it is, all, all of these things. So I think AI will take over mass production and mass production will, will be able to uh, take over more parts of production, especially of goods. But in, in services and in ingenuity and in those really, really narrow niches, you're going to be able to sell man-made things at a very high price simply because suddenly there's a market that, that can afford it. So those things are suddenly uh, possible to have as a full-time income. Is that it? All right, thank you. Thank you, Professor Bynum. Uh, as a token of our appreciation for your visit to the Bahamas. Oh. Thank Hope you. Hope you enjoyed for you and Suzanne. Thank and, you. And uh, I'd like at uh, this moment also to thank our sponsors, um, the Templeton Religion Trust, Bahamas Wholesale, Eight, um, wholesale agencies um, and um, Compass Point and uh, we hope uh, that you continue to come to this uh, series of lectures hope you enjoy it and have a good night <laughs>